Hey folks, how's it going? Thanks for joining. And I appreciate the patience. I like to give people a little bit of time to trickle in. Um, today I'm excited to interview Paco. Uh, Paco is the founder and CEO at Prodigy Techs uh, based in Chicago. Um, this is the second interview uh, I've done in the last couple of weeks. The first one was with Ross Decker. Um, got really good attendance and people said it was really helpful. So I wanted to keep doing these. Um, hopefully I can interview Paco about some of the awesome things that he's been able to implement as he's been growing his MSP. Um, Paco, are you there? You hear me? Yep. Oh, I think I need to, this happened last time. I need to let you turn your, <laughs> your, uh, um, camera on. Okay. As I'm doing that, um, there you go. You should be able to, um, yeah, so Paco, how's it going? It's going. It's uh, been an interesting uh, last several months. I guess it's now a year. Now that I can tally it all together. It feels like it's been like 67 months, but you know, I can't complain. Things are good. Cool. So um, we met quite a while ago. I think I was still CEO of Repair Tech. I think we met at ChannelCon, right? In person yes. for the first time, at least. Yes. Yep. And that, so that would have been in Chicago. Yep. So that was in uh, August of 2015 or July of 2015. Yeah. Quite a while ago. Yeah. That was fun. Um, I think that was the first conference I had been to. Um, so it was cool to get to meet you guys in person. We'd talked a little bit cause you work with, you know, you were working on pod nuts and stuff with, with Jeff. Um, yeah. So that's cool. It's exciting to be able to interview you. I know we've talked a lot, but I haven't, ask some of these questions to you. So I'm super sure. interested to hear the answers. Um, and again, <laughs> if anybody has any, um, if anybody has any questions or anything, feel free to put them in. I can feed them to Paco as we're going. Um, cool. So can you tell me about like your journey before you started Prodigy Text? Like how did you, how did you get there? So it's interesting. Um, so basically pre project text, I was a database manager for two software um, automation companies. <clears throat> the first one was an automotive software company, uh, actually not too far from where my office is now, uh, you know, in Greektown, uh, in downtown Chicago, in the West Loop. And then I moved to over to uh, Evanston, which they were, that was a pharmaceutical consulting company. So essentially doing the same thing, handling reporting, things like that. Um, but always was, you know, had that tech bug and, and really wanted to do the intricate tinkering stuff like that and, you know, getting the degree and all that sort of deal and then helped out a buddy of mine with his uh, IT small business and kind of just branched off from there. Awesome. Cool. Um, and then, uh, yeah, so then how did you, you ended up starting Prodigy Techs by yourself or how did that happen? Yeah. So I pretty much, uh, <clears throat> I started it by myself. Um, it was, so it's funny because the company started out of, I would say out of spite. It's kind of the fun situation. Um, uh -huh. my, my buddy who ran his it company at the time, um, I felt could be doing things a little bit differently. And it was one of those where I felt like I can do things a little bit more efficient, a little bit in a grander scale, things like that. So that was back in 2011. Um, but before that, you know, I would say that, you know, I never had the whole entrepreneur bug, sm start a small business, things like that. Um, so this kind of just pushed me toward that edge. And then kind of coming into 2013, you know, at that point, you know, I had my daughter who was, uh, I think, two at the time going on to being three, you know, I was kind of getting burnt out where I was and I just wanted something a little bit different. And one thing led to another and just ended up getting a, a virtual office that was about 10 minutes away from where I was working and, you know, started a, a, a small computer repair shop, essentially a virtual computer repair shop um, and just kind of moonlighted, you know, as I was working and after hours doing that for probably a couple of years. So you were, you were doing that part-time for a couple of years and then you were doing it full-time at some point on your own? Yeah. So basically back in, uh, toward the end of 2016, right in, in like the third week of December, 
Um, we so I, at the pharmaceutical consulting company, they have 22 offices around the world. So because the industry of with pharmaceuticals, a lot of those companies were in Europe. So the US hours were essentially after, <clears throat> after hours. So that was where they kind of decided to shift offices. So we ended up, uh, they ended up eliminating the entire department, getting going everything uh, overseas. And then that's what kind of just gave me my start to go full time back in 2017 or end of 2016, which literally like it was a week of the year left. And then really 2017 was when I started originally and have been full time since. Cool. And so how big is the company now? So we're at five people. So we're at five employees. Um, so we got our back office person, a tech, uh, two techs and a uh, business development rep, fancy name for a salesperson. Um, so she helps us with like the renewals and the upsells and new business and things like that. So it's been kind of that transition of delegating things as we go. Yeah. So can you walk me through like the who you hired at what point and why, like, why did you add that particular role at that time? Sure. <clears throat> so I want to say, so, you know, I've been a solo tech probably up until May of this year. So I've been running the business for at that point, seven years, a little over seven years. And it was to a point where I needed to get a little breathing room. I had to figure out what I was going to do. Um, and what can I delegate to be better at what I'm doing? And I found that in 2019, we, ex we received a lot of great growth, but that was because I was working a lot in my business. I, I shut out a lot of the things that I was needing to do, <clears throat> got off a lot of the nonprofit boards I was a part of and really concentrate on the business. But what I realized was I was working so much in the business and driving up revenue and things that that nature, I lost the ability of working on the business. So for those that don't know the difference, obviously working in your business is doing the day to day tasks, but working on your business is obviously, you know, strategizing, understanding where you're going to be forecasting, um, just planning out the longevity of your business. So I felt that one piece that kind of bogged me down was really the back office piece. Um, getting the, the documentation, the uh, accounts payable, receivables, all that sort of deal. So I actually hired uh, an office manager first. Um, and it worked out because in 2019, for the first half of that year, uh, my office manager actually was helping me um, kind of in the same similar fashion. She was working her full time job and helping me uh, on the side. And then as of May of this year, I brought her on officially um, part time initially, and now she's in a, in a full time position. And that's kind of what helped us just get a little bit more efficiency into the business. But also we discovered a lot of problems as well when it comes to expanding kind of moving forward. Um, so that was May of this year. And then things were going well, things were good, but then I still felt like I was doing a lot of the on task stuff, the day to day, the remote work and stuff like that. And especially with a lot of the shelter in place that was going on at the time, everything was really remote. So what we ended up doing was hiring a remote technician. Um, so we actually went through a hiring agency um, called Freelance. Uh, Freelance Latin America was the company that we were made aware of through uh, our membership with the Tech Tribe. And you know, spoke to a couple of the guys there um, who used Freelance as their, um, essentially their uh, uh, freelance hiring location. Um, and these, and my, so my technician is uh, remote out in Venezuela. So we basically uh, hired, brought him on in July, and that's kind of what helped with a lot of the remote work and, and things of that nature. And then probably around, I want to say August or so. Um, well, let me back up a little bit. So we actually did hire uh, um, a HR person for on a project basis, because mm. we felt like we were growing. And at the way that we were going, we wanted to make sure that we had kind of all our ducks in a row. So, yeah, you know, smart. employee, employee handbooks and like stuff for us to reference from an HR professional that me or my office manager just didn't know kind of what's what. And that was very beneficial. So she was on with us for uh, about three months or so. Um, kind of getting everything down, you know, the vacation times, what's allowed, you know, what's on our size, benefits, things of that nature, just for us to kind of really un understand what we're going to try and do. And then from there, we ended up hiring our business development rep, um, who handles all obviously the sales piece of it. Um, and what helped with her was she already had experience in the IT field 
for handling a lot of sales, just not in the MSP space. So she was aware of things like CompTIA and certification and stuff like that. So it was an easier transition for her to kind of get acquainted with it, um, you know, and specifically with the tools, Synchro, et cetera. And then from there, we hired our, uh, once we kind of got that going, we hired our on-site tech uh, locally here, um, who's part-time right now, but essentially um, we got him just doing essentially the on-site stuff. Um, if I happen to be at one place for a project, um, he can handle, you know, a server inst or a PC install or workstation install or whatever the case may be. And if it's not needed, then I have him and uh, my remote tech handling a lot of the remote work, right? And that's really where the majority of things are kind of happening. Um, so that's kind of what kind of rounded out our, our base and the, uh, the remote tech kind of came in around October ish or so. Um, and that's kind of where we're at right now. Cool. Yeah. That's awesome. Congratulations. Um, it's fun to fun to grow. And then I know also having done it, it's, <laughs> it's a lot of work, right. And a lot of learning. Yeah. So I'm curious, like you were operating things part-time then full-time by yourself for quite a while and things have accelerated. What are some of the things that you've had to learn growing the team? Yeah. So it's interesting because, you know, my entire team is remote, right? So just because of, uh, of just the pandemic right now, and I'm just worried of the health with, uh, for my employees, um, you know, we do have an office here in, in, in uh, the West Loop in downtown Chicago. However, just preferred everyone and everyone kind of obviously prefers to work from home, essentially with depending on what their own personal lives, if especially if they get the throughput. Um, but what I found interesting is, or challenging is being able to give that delegation, but providing the transparency along with it, right? So the goal, the game, you know, the goal for everyone is to say, hey, you take this piece, you run with it, you now take care of it, right? And there are going to be a lot of questions where you realize you ran things in such a certain way that you kind of know where in that phrase where the bodies are buried. So that's where it becomes very interesting to try and figure out, okay, how do I make it transparent, right? So, you know, developing other systems, whether it's processes and things of that nature, and then just a location for where information should be, right? And we've all talked about this. We've heard many of podcasts, people kind of just talking about how documentation is important, documentation is important, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but this is really that piece where documentation is, is going to be helpful, especially when it comes to internal documentation. Um, so leveraging your password managers and, and a lot of the processes for that is concerned. Um, but that was probably one of the more challenging is break understanding that you did something a certain way and breaking it into a piece where it's not only a transparent piece, but also that it could be done by other people, right? In a process way. Yeah. Um, it, we have a term internally that's, you mentioned like where the bodies are buried and stuff yeah. and you yeah. having done a lot of it. We have a term internally um, based on this story. I forget who wrote it. It's like a, yeah, it's called meatloaf. So <laughs> if you go search like meatloaf story, it's basically like, um, uh, I think to sum up the story, it's like a grandma has this meatloaf recipe and passes it down through generations. And, you know, the granddaughter like cuts off the two ends of the meatloaf because that's part of the recipe and puts yeah. it in the oven. And eventually they're like, why are we cutting off the two ends of the meatloaf? And they go and she talks to her mom and her mom's like, I don't know, that's how grandma did it. And then they go and talk to grandma and she's like, why are you doing that? I just did that because the pan was too small. And so <laughs> it's like, you know, you have these like traditions that are passed down or like ways of doing things that are passed down. And like often they're antiquated and don't need to be that way. So like right. we, talk, we talk about that as meatloaf. Um, Got it. Anyway, um, I just think that's very memorable. Uh, yeah, that's story. awesome. So um, yeah, cool. So um, I'm curious, like in terms of hiring those people, um, I'm assuming you guys are bootstrapped. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So obviously you can only hire as you really like have free cash flow or um, maybe you have some money saved and you make a bet that this will help you right. grow. Um, can you just like walk me through how you thought about when to hire and what to hire for in each of those cases? I mean, sure. obviously you talked about what they were doing and it totally makes sense, but in terms of like 
some people are like, oh, well, my profit's going to go way down. I'm like kind of scared to hire this person. So can you talk, talk me through that? Sure. Um, so it's funny because, you know, I was in that same piece, right? Like trying to figure out, you know, what's the bet? How do I make sure that this is going to be profitable? And, you know, I had a very good conversation with uh, Tom Bull over at Two River Computer, um, who really helped me understand, especially when it came to hiring not only just a salesperson or just employees in general. Um, and the good rule that he kind of told me was, you know, if you're trying to figure out who you're going to hire, they should be bringing in two and a half times whatever they are being paid or what they're bringing to the table, right? So if you have an employee that, let's say a part-time guy, you're paying 750 bucks a month, right? You know, in reality, they should be bringing you close toward a little over two grand a month in some type of value, whether that's time returning back to you so you can reinvest that, um, or like in sales, they should be bringing in that amount of money in to help grow the business. So that's really the rule that we kind of try to do from that point. Now, I will say that when, you know, I didn't know this and when I hired the back office uh, manager uh, or, op or office manager was really more of, okay, I'm making this amount of money. And the first goal for me from there was I need to get on an official payroll because it's a pain in the butt to try and prove I make what I make from business transfers and, you know, 1099s, which you shouldn't be doing if you're in a, a legit S corporation or a LLC or whatever, because there are rules behind that for the owner. But, you know, we did what we had to do in the beginning. And, you know, that was the main goal. How do I get myself into payroll? And how do I make sure that payroll is consistent, right? Once I got to that point, then this was, okay, well, how much money is in the bank? And do we have at least 60 days worth of to pay our bills to be able to afford another person, right? Sometimes you got, you know, depending on the growth, you could get off with 30 days or whatever, but especially if you're doing with back office or not anything with sales, um, or you're going to concentrate on yourself to do sales, that's kind of how we looked at it from there. So when I looked at it, I was like, all right, I can afford a part-time person. You know, it's not going to break me. We'll be able to pay the bills. I'm getting paid. We should be all right, right? Um, and that's how I kind of based it from there. And then obviously when I sp spoke with Tom, I kind of readjusted that thinking a little bit. Um, and that's kind of how I've operated so far. So with the five people we got right now, you know, until we get a little bit of increase in certain things here, or we find that we're more efficient on some other areas, whether it's tools, whether it's input, things of that nature can warrant the expansion of like my part-time guy going full-time or adding another role or adding on anything really is when it, even when it comes down to systems, um, can we afford it, right? Because the last thing you want to do, and this is something I learned very early on, is you can't buy your success. Like there's no way that you can, someone can tell you buy these thousand dollars worth of tools and you're going to next month be making you know, X amount of five figures, six figures, you know, every month be a seven figure uh, IT business overnight, right? Um, so that's, a, that, and that's kind of what the industry I feel did a lot in the beginning. And I think we're, it's a little bit better now. There are things that are a lot more transparent, but I remember early on, there were a lot of um, influencers in the industry that would say this kind of message and it kind of, you know, and I was guilty of that. I fell into that hole and, and found myself in an extreme debt trying to figure out how I was going to pay, you know, my personal income from payroll to the business when I was moonlighting and doing it part time. Um, but that's something you want to keep in mind is just having that idea, which is, again, that two and a half times what they're bringing in as a kind of a standard goal. But also just understanding that you don't have to run before you kind of you know, crawl or observe maybe even before you make that jump, but making the jump makes it all that much more fun. You just got to know how to do it in your own means. Yeah. So if we could maybe like go through an example, like if I'm mm. hearing you right, the office manager, you might say, well, the office manager is going to save me 15 hours a week, yep. which means I can increase my billable time by 15 hours a week. Correct. And if I'm charging just for round numbers, a hundred dollars an hour, Mm -hmm. That's $1,500, you know, a week, yep. right? So it's what, six, I'm bad at arithmetic, $6,000 a month. So that should be able to pay, you know, then you use the two and a half rule, as you put it. Yep. Um, I'm not even going to try that. So, you know, whatever, <laughs> that should, that should theoretically pay for that person's 15 hours 
Um, if you look at it like that, of course, that makes some assumptions. One assumption is you're actually going to increase your billable hours by 15 hours a week, right? Right. So there's right. lots of stuff to think about there. But, um, you know, if you can put some math behind it, that's helpful. I think another thing that's that's really helpful for us is figuring in ramp time. So the right. person's not going to come in and all of a sudden save you 15 hours, right? If anything, right. it's probably the opposite. You're right. probably going to have to train them and do a bunch of stuff. And it might take more of your time up front, but maybe after a month, they become profitable or maybe after two months or whatever it might be. So in particular, where I think that's really interesting is salespeople. Correct. Um, so I think if we could walk through maybe the scenario with the salesperson, like how did you think about that two and a half number or, you know, when it made sense to bring them in? Like, what was that like in your head? Sure. So I think from there, um, we had that two and a half percent, but also that 90 day tr term is kind of what we also implement as well as far as ramp up time, right? Um, because you can't just baby them forever per se or hold their hand essentially. Um, but you can't expect them to day one, go out, start selling. You got to trust the process, right? Um, and being that she was my first salesperson, that's kind of, again, you know, having that training, implementing, I mean, it's going to be a big cost up front. Um, and really like, you know, even going back to what Tom had mentioned, he's like, you gotta, like, if you want a very efficient salesperson, like they really should be full time is the one piece. And two, you have to know that you may be blowing $50,000. Like you might be blowing $50,000 in whatever the training materials are, time in uh, influx payments, whatever the commission, uh, uh, um, structure that you have, which in this case, what we did for our commission structure is basically we pay them an hourly rate. Plus we give them um, either first month's uh, monthly recurring revenue or 10% of the project labor wise is kind of how we um, take care of our salesperson. But, you know, you know, you have to know that you're going to probably lose 50 grand when it's all said and done, if it doesn't work out. So when you have, when you, when some people hear that number, it's either I need to sell more as a business owner or, okay, I can probably make that gamble in hopes to get 150 grand essentially, or a hundred, I'm sorry, 125 grand, um, to make this work. Right. And that's kind of the goal for it all to try and get to that piece. Um, but like you said, there's so many things that are involved. I would love to say that that's a hard, fast two and a half percent, 90 days, whatever we're going to lose, but you got to also look at that sometimes too. Even if you're trying to go with another service that offers sales services or lead generation, you know, they're going to quote you a certain amount of money and you got to understand, okay, how much is it costing them per hour to do? Is that how much am I even going to make? And is it going to benefit for me from it? And then, you know, is it a gamble you're willing to make? You know, it could be that you spend $30,000 in the year from what they're offering you. Is that enough upside for you? Or are you okay losing 30,000 if it doesn't work? So it's that type of stuff that you got to try and figure out from that piece. But that's essentially the model that we have, or at least what we've thought of right now for our salesperson, um, things may change, but I think as we kind of grow, you know, her role will probably mo uh, um, shift as well. Cause essentially she is the account manager per se, when it comes to these renewals and understanding what are the things to upsell as well. So. Makes sense. Yeah. I think some of the best practices I've heard around like the sales compensation plans are like, usually they're like 50, 50 base an incentive, um, you know, making up the on-track earnings. And then, um, yeah, I think, I think, uh, figuring out like what the ratio is of MRR or monthly recurring revenue you expect them to bring in versus like total what you're paying them out, including benefits and everything. Um, and like, if that ratio is like six to 12, you're in like a pretty good spot. I mean, 12 is like really good. Right, right, right. Um, yeah, so cool. So um, that's all super helpful. I, you mentioned like tools and how the MSP space pitches lots of tools. We got a question here from, from Mike. He's wondering like, what are all the tools that you use in your business? And, um, you know, what are you using for things like PSA, RMM, quotes, VoIP, et cetera? Sure. So that's a long, as li a long list. So yeah. Um, I would say that, you know, for PSA and RMM, I'm using Synchro. So um, we were early adopters way back when we were, I mean, down to when we were on Repair Shopper and combining with an RMM. And then we made the jump in 2017 and then uh, kind of been there as the things have improved. Um, you know, we're using AV, we're using Bitdefender. 
um, along with all of the other components of ATS and, um, or I'm sorry, AT, uh, anti threat, uh, expo anti exploit, um, is this called different things in the, in the, in the dashboard, um, EDR, et cetera, things like that. Um, you know, we are using for VoIP, it's funny, we're actually transitioned everything to Microsoft Teams. So we're a Microsoft house internally. Uh, so we, you know, got on the business voice, got everything all loaded up into that system. And then uh, really all the other tools, I mean, I can name them all off. We, what I would say is that we made sure to it, all of our tools did two things, either A, it integrated into Synchro or B, it was purchased or can be bought by our distributor PAX8, which also integrates into Synchro um, just for billing one piece and then two for um, creating tickets and, and things of that nature. So that's been really helpful um, for us on trying to get that piece down. Um, and then really uh, the biggest thing that I would probably say that was kind of our shift in focus as far as tools is onboarding Rocket Cyber and getting Rocket Cyber as our, our SOC because they allow us to create tickets right into uh, Synchro, but also we can feed a lot of the, um, a lot of the uh, logs from Bitdefender, from a lot of these other sources, and you have one dashboard to generate these alerts and, and, and reporting and things of that nature has made it a lot easier for us, especially when it comes down to our firewall logs, which we use on Tangle. Um, which integrates with Bitdefender and all that sort of deal. It's been helpful for us is that for that as well. Awesome. Um, and then like in terms of tooling, what about on the sales and marketing side? Like what do you guys do there? So right. So it's funny. So this is part of that growing piece and trying to understand what we want to try and do. Um, so before we've been using uh, Synchro Mailer for a lot of the communications internally, uh, some we did some MailChimp, but we try to do a lot of it into the mailer inside of there. But as far as for sales and proposals, we're using Zomentum um, just because one, we feel that they have a, a really great op uh, uh, option of building out the proposals, um, you know, aligning on a lot of the, the, the sales queue and the pipeline. And it doesn't overload the synchro system with prospects under the customer module. So we felt that this would help us go that route. And then when we close the, the, the prospect, it will automatically create a, the customer in um, inside of Synchro, and then it will allow us to kind of kick off the onboarding process and, and so forth and so on. Awesome. Um, and like, oh, I'm sorry. Okay. So marketing, oh, yeah. um, cause I just did sales. So marketing, we actually enrolled with tech marketing engine. So we, a lot, we are doing the, our websites on them. We do, um, they help with our blog posts on providing, you know, we provide them the topics of what we're trying to talk into from our specific verticals we're trying to attack or just technologies that we're trying to pivot to. So Microsoft Teams is one that we're really trying to dive into um, down to the point of being certified and, and all that sort of stuff from Microsoft, just to say that we know what we know inside of Teams on an official capacity and really going to market with that. So they've been really instrumental in our growth because not only were they able to redo the site that because we were on tech site builder, which is one of their components, but the blog pieces and then automating our review process, because I was, I'm a huge per, uh, uh, proponent on reviews. If there's one thing that I can tell you to date, if you want to grow your business is ask for reviews, whether that's in Google, whether that's in clutch, whether that is in Yelp or any other review site that you're um, getting a lot of leads from increase your reviews, reply to those reviews, and you'll notice an uptick in a lot of your, um, on, uh, on um, what's the word I'm looking for, organic uh, reach, because Google just loves to see that interaction and along with other sites. So feeding that monster will help you get a lot of those details in there. And I feel that with Tech Marketing Engine's blog pieces, it achieved that piece for us, but also it allowed us to get the content marketing piece that I can now load um, my business development rep with certain content pieces when speaking and doing prospecting. Hey, this is what's going on. It's the holidays. There's a lot of scams going on. Here's a blog post. If you want to read it, um, if you're interested, we can give you a dark web report if you're curious about it, things like that. So it, it, it's helped on a lot of the marketing front on that. And especially with a lot of the graphics with our, um, I have a great graphic designer over at, um, Bia Colina, who is a graphic designer that I've used, revamped our logo, revamped a lot of our branding and stuff like that. Um, so she's been really helpful for us on getting that route. So 
all that kind of combined for our marketing is more on a content marketing piece and loading our team, including myself, on trying to drive that traffic and brand awareness to get people in front of the door. It sounds like you get most of your leads from like inbound content marketing and then like the review sites. Is that right? For that's one big piece of it. The other piece is we have a referral um, um, partnership with a couple bigger uh, MSPs in the area. So the reason why we kind of succeeded in basically downtown Chicago, where as everyone knows, probably Chicago and a lot of metro cities have a big influx of MSPs and IT businesses. Some are bigger, some are smaller. Um, but what we've been able to do is create partnerships with through some of the organizations that I'm a part of nonprofits and, and things like that, or just like community groups and BNIs and things or BNI types of uh, groups. So we established these partnerships where if a client doesn't meet their criteria, they would provide that warm lead to us. And then we would have a relationship um, to kind of work that out. So that's also been a big piece of our growth as well is having those referral relationships with some of the other uh, players in the city as well. Cool. That's awesome. Yeah. It must be interesting being in like a really large city. Like, is there anything in particular that you think about or do to kind of set yourself apart? There's probably a lot of competitors out there. So I'm just curious if you can speak a little more to that. Sure. I think the biggest piece for us is our, our messaging of we want to help underserved small businesses. And what I mean by that is in the area, usually businesses that are 20 users or less are not really given an eye um, for a lot of the things that they do. And where for us, 10 to 20 users is a nice chunk for us to kind of get through um, and onboard and, and bring on some good value those businesses oftentimes are greeted with long contracts or they are greeted with a price for as if they were a 50 to 100 person seat company, um, especially in this area. Um, you know, and a lot, I know a lot of colleagues will badger us and say, you know, you got to charge contracts, you have to charge lengths. But I'm in the, I believe that, you know, if a client want to, wants to get out of their contract, they're going to get out of their contract. Like either they're not going to pay you, they're going to take you to court. You're going to go through a stress of headaches. If it's miserable for you and them, why keep trying to go through all that, in my opinion? Um, unless obviously you've grown faster than you can keep up. And obviously you got to kind of keep the lights on. That's obviously totally understandable. Um, but that is something where we have that uh, diversified our efforts in those two categories um, and just specifically more on the boutique law firms, the healthcare, independent healthcare providers, um, and a lot of the manufacturing facilities that are in the outskirts of Chicago and the suburbs have really been where we've been able to kind of take on a lot of that growth and it allows us to I mean, we're not charging cheap, right? I mean, I think that, you know, there are those that are charging cheaper rates and they're getting those type of clients and everyone's happy, but you run into that churn and burn or you get into a piece where you're just kind of miserable. It's, you got so much work that you just don't know what to do with yourself. I mean, we're at the point where our pricing is we're about at average of where we are for the city and people pay us, right? And I think it's that's that that's what sets us apart in that route. Um, and we're also revamping our branding as well to answer that much better than just saying underserved uh, clients and, you know, this is the way we do business. We're working on our unique selling points right now with the marketing, with tech marketing engine and our graphic designer to really highlight that on an online marketing basis so that it's not we're talking about it. People can look up and see why we're different than the rest. Yeah, that makes sense. Like thinking back on when we were trying to figure out what our pricing should be when we were launching Synchro, like we looked around and we saw lots of folks doing big contracts, like trying to get people into one or two year contracts kind of thing. Or three now um, I'm hearing. <laughs> or, or three, yeah. And I was, you know, I think our thought process there was if we just provide a really good product and a really good experience and keep increasing the value, that should keep people paying us, not the contract, you know? Right, 100%. I think if we're relying on the contract, then we're probably doing something wrong. Right. So I think, yeah, I, I think that resonates with me. Obviously, the reason people do contracts is because it works, right? There, right? If you have a product 
um, or a business that's like low barrier to entry or like low switching costs, then it can make sense because people will just switch on a whim, you know? Uh, um, right. To save a couple of nickels to try right. and get to it. Exactly. Yep. Right. So it, uh, it just depends on your business, but yeah, what you said resonates with me. We got a couple questions here based on what you said. Okay. Um, so do you, how, can you talk about like your billing and, and like what you, you talked about like under 20 employees, like how are you billing people? Do you charge per user per endpoint? Like what's kind of your target customer there and how much do you want to see per seat? Sure. Um, so right now it's funny because we always used to charge per device. However, now that we are transitioning and opening our eyes more on how to manage the cloud, and that security piece of it, we're actually gonna be moving to per user probably sometime in the end of Q Q1. Um, so like in March timeframe, just to give a lot of the guys more heads up. For a majority of them, they shouldn't see a change in the billing, but it's more of, you know, we're starting to find that we are doing a lot more remotely. And as the endpoints are not becoming more and more um, susceptible and there's a lot of older hardware some of them are just saying well i just use my phone or i use my um my tablet or i don't even use a computer i just try and get on the email on the browser and the work computer whatever the case may be um we still have to manage those users because each one obviously has their own harboring security situation as well and i think that's what helped that's what helped us understand and by getting into rocket cyber kind of showing us like how this landscape is changing um, so we, we are on a per device basis, but we will be going to a per user basis. Um, right now, I think probably if we were to go with total seats as far as cost and the range, um, it really depends. If it's a remote only, we're talking about on the lower end of the 100, 100 bucks a seat. If we are talking about full service, we're out closer to 150 to 200 bucks a seat. So it really depends on that area of it. And that's just because we haven't fully implemented a lot of the cloud tools that we want to put in yet. Um, a lot of these tools are um, on a, we're including it, see if you like it. And then in the next go around, it's, all right, do you want to enroll in it? And then the next time after that is, hey, this is what's happening. Your bill's going up. Do you want to stay with us or not? Right. And it, it's all not to just force their hand, but it's more of trying to make sure that we have their security in mind, right? And that's what essentially keeps us up at night, so. So when you're charging like per per employee, essentially, like yeah. what's it, what's included in that? If they have three devices or, you know, they have maybe a setup at work and a setup at home, is that all included? Yeah, so essentially, well, the per device situation was per device. So each device counted as its own entity of things. So, you know, you got your endpoint security stuff, your cloud security stuff, your monitoring, um, things like that. Uh, and then obviously on a domain basis, you got like, the do you know, monitoring of the domains, monitoring of, you know, setting up the, you know, locking down the email domains for like SPF, DKIM, DMARC, getting into the two FAs, all that sort of deal. Um, so a lot of that is included in the service, but up front there is like an onboarding phase, which is more of a project rate. Um, and that is where, you know, we try to knock out all the on sites. We try to knock out all of the everything from there to limit the on site as most as possible. We try to keep it as remote as possible to keep it in the billing, um, which limits the on site bit, uh, piece of it. But in the initial phase, there's a lot more on site to get an understanding, at least pre-COVID, we're trying to adjust that process now so we don't have to go on site. But if there is an on-site visit, we normally do charge. And that's at the uh, hourly rate. Yeah, so um, so obviously there's some stuff that's not included, as you mentioned. For sure. In, in, yep. in, yeah, so what, what, are the, what are some of the line items that you most commonly sell that aren't included in the, in the plan? So I think right now it's more labor pieces because we, so let me back up. So as far as what is not included is if they're in a remote plan or if it is, um, how do I say a, um, what's the best word I'm trying to figure out? If we're trying to go ahead and let's say on onboarding in the onboarding phase, let's say, and we're talking in contracts, everything in the, in our support, in our, payments, perceits, whatever the case may be, is on a support basis. So if it has to do with support, 
it will be more than likely included if it's not in the onboarding phase. But if it's, you know, they're moving, you know, cable needs to be run, uh, new network equipment, network installation, um, transferring of desktop machines or purchasing of new uh, PCs, those are all projects, right? And they're not so technically support, at least how we define it. Um, and that's essentially what gets charged extra outside of that. Um, but everything else is really more on, like those would be those line items or any new items that we include moving forward. So if we have a like, you know, adding rocket cyber as a sock service, you know, that may be a new line item for some of my clients that didn't have it two, three years ago, or, you know, things like that. But we try to make sure that they know that this is not an expense. This is more of, this is what they need. Like these are tools that we're providing to them tailored to them in order for them for their needs. So we would have our three tier per se, like we have our um, basic premium and plus, you know, and you get this, you get this and you get this. But in reality, it's all discussed like, this is where you're going to be as a starting point, but we are going to eventually move to you there because of the needs that come along. We just are going to have to do this in a phased approach. And we just need to have a plan in place. So it's not a gotcha or, man, you just added an extra $200 per seat or whatever the case may be. Um, it's more of now that, you know, what's keeping us up at night and how do I feel better about myself uh, supporting my client? Because the last thing any of us wants to do is one, get the call that says, your client's been breached and you got to take care of it. That's, I think, what put, keeps us all at night. But two, providing the documentation that we did everything we could. And that's really where it comes into that big piece for what we're trying to do. Yeah, so um, just talking about like pitching it as a need versus like a expense. Yeah. Um, is there something like you train your sales folks to do there? You mentioned dark web scanning. I know that's a strategy that, that some people use to kind of get a foot in the door. But sure. um, yeah, can you speak a little bit to to that? Sure. Um, I think kind of our strategy recently has been more education marketing. Um, we've been trying to, because I, I frown upon fear mongering as much as possible, but I know that there's a difference between fear mongering and educating. Like people need to know these things are happening, right? It's just on how you stress that to the client or person, right? So some of our strategies of what we have done is we will go ahead and, and I learned this from Al Appier over at uh, CyberGuard360, um, who has a great product over there for our dark web monitoring that we use for some of that stuff, is providing security awareness training as a loss leader and being able to provide that to, let's say you're doing a webinar or you're doing some type, you know, before it used to be in person, lunch and learns. But um, in this case, you know, I do a lot of work with a lot of nonprofits. So, you know, we do a lot of webinar trainings and things of that nature. And, you know, at the end, depending on what the topic is, like, if it's like, let's say, for example, phishing, or, you know, certain type of scams, hey, if you feel like you don't have a, a wrangle on your employees of what they're doing, here's a security awareness training, free of charge, we're not good. There's no, you know, gotchas that you have to pay for it or whatever the case may be. We enroll them. And then my business development rep will basically just follow up really. And it becomes a natural conversation. Hey, we noticed three of your employees didn't complete the training. Is there anything, you know, we can help out with? Can we do something else? And we try to provide as much of that uh, good will as possible and that value. And then it ends up just evolving in a natural state of, you know what, I think we're probably going to need a little bit more. Can you talk to us and see what we can do? That's kind of what we've really been able to be more successful is the security awareness training. Um, the dark web monitoring is, yeah, I think everyone's kind of doing the dark web stuff. Um, I think that it really is, um, you got to just tailor it in a right way. I mean, I think everyone being able to offer that, you just got to give your own nice little spin. I mean, we have newsletters, we have things like that, that we send out to other promotions that we have advertisements and things like that to try and attract to it, get a nice little landing page, make sure you're mobile first, because sometimes your website may do something funky where it looks nice on the desktop, but doesn't look as great on the mobile stuff. So, you know, using like a click funnels or something like that may help. Um, but that I would say the security awareness training was something that kind of opened up our eyes that helped lead into a lot better conversations with people. Nice. That's awesome. 
Um, and then in terms of like getting leads, I'm curious, like you mentioned some of the channels, do you guys spend money on marketing or is it mostly like through your kind of conversations and stuff? Sure. So yes, but not on an official capacity. So we are, so 2020 has been a very great year to us and we got accepted to a Facebook program that uh, Facebook has called Elevate Circle, which they're trying to concentrate on um, a lot of businesses that are kind of in a flux in COVID and how to better understand their content uh, delivery system. So we have spent money on there. We have been working with Google on the PPP stuff, uh, PPC stuff, um, just because, you know, with computer repair and IT support, it's kind of been frowned upon lately because of a lot of the scammers and, and things like that from before. So we have not, but the plan is we will, we will have the budget for it, um, which that is going to be interesting because there's a high spend in Chicago. So we're working on that strategy right now. Cool. How do you think about, maybe, maybe you don't know yet, but that's okay. How do you, how are you like thinking about that spend and like how much to spend and like how you know, whether the experiment worked and that kind of sure. stuff. Sure. So I could speak to the Facebook thing, which was interesting is when, you know, we have a Facebook pixel on our site. Um, same thing with the Google Analytics. So if you guys don't know what the Facebook pixel is or Google Analytics, whether you're a solo tech or you have your marketing uh, marketing team, talk to um, them and just make sure you have it. Because even if you just put that on there and forget about it, which I did with Facebook pixel, I had it on like seven years or six years ago or something like that, completely forgot about it. So when I was a part of the program, it was, you want to be able to create audiences to target, right? That's specific. And they say, you know, if you listen to a lot of the social media uh, uh, influencers like Gary Vee and stuff like that, Facebook, 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 Facebook. Problem is, is that sometimes you don't have the data to target your people that you want. So that's our case. Like you have to have at least a thousand website visitors within the last 28 days in order to create some type of audience in Facebook. So this is where you have to switch from, okay, I want to spend money to make money. Now I have to spend money to go into brand awareness. I have to bring people to at least see the website so that I can know who's seeing the website to target, right? Um, so that was kind of the one of the programs that we ended up doing. And I think we spent like 250 bucks across 10 days um, to see how many we can bring in. And really it brought in probably closer to the thousand mark, but we didn't really hit it there. I think if we were to run it again, it probably add another 250, so about 500 bucks spend for 20 days or a month. Um, it'll give us that brand awareness to go tip over to figure out who's visiting the website. Um, but that's how some of these mechanisms work. Google ads, I couldn't tell you because when I used to run Google ads before, one, there wasn't that big strenuous thing going on with um, the IT support industry and IT in general. Um, also at that time I was doing more computer repair. Um, so PPC uh, doing a PPC strategy for a computer repair shop is completely different than an IT support and MSP in my opinion. Um, so that has been interesting because that PPC, I have just don't have the experience in, but when I've looked up the stats, it's a much higher spend than what I was spending back then. And back then I was spending about maybe anywhere between three to about 450 bucks a month in PPC for Google ads at the time. And we were getting in about 2000 to about $2,500 in repairs at the time. So it was a good mark for what was going on. My problem that I'm running into right now, which is kind of one of the struggles marketing wise is when you type in computer repair, Chicago, we're on higher on the list and we no longer do that anymore. So we're ranking more for computer repair still, and we're still trying to steer the slow ship to it support. So that's what, the guys over at TME and 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 uh, uh, Beatrice, who's our graphic designer from her company, they're helping us try and get that going where it outweighs it too. Um, it's so it's a never evolving battle, but I can say for like that for the Facebook PPC, um, for the Facebook ads, Google ads, you know, it's going to be a research. I mean, you got to set a, a, a budget that you're okay with. Sometimes the initial budget is not, you're not going to know what it is. So you're going to want to do a lifetime budget of what you're comfortable with. And then you'll see, is it enough if it's not enough? And if it's not enough, is this something you want to put more money into? Or do you want to get your attention somewhere else?
really is where it goes to at that point where, where you want to spend your money. Yeah, totally. Yes. I think that's where like having good data matters, yeah, right? Like hundred percent. if you know your churn rate and your average monthly revenue, you can kind of like back into a lifetime value. And then if you can look at your spend and really know where you're getting your users or <laughs> I say users, but you know, your, <laughs> your clients yeah. from, um, then you can like calculate your customer acquisition cost. And then you can do like your CAC to LTV ratio. So there's, yeah. So the only it's, thing I'll add on to that specifically, if for someone that is trying to do that is the tracking is most important. You can't just throw 350 bucks into something, hope that they go to the homepage and you're like, all right, whatever it's, it is what it is. Like one, you can get that information from Google analytics because they should be able to tell you it's coming from there. But really what you want to do is create some specific landing pages that you're loading to these ads. So, you know, there's nothing that can hit this page other than this, right? So that's the biggest piece that I would, I would stress is make sure you have your tracking in place because you have to measure it. If your website is not able to measure that type of stuff, you just got an online brochure. And unfortunately, it's just not going to do you anything. It's nice. It's pretty. People can contact you on it, but you don't know what it's doing to make you money. Right. Another way to think about it is like, make sure that your experiments are using the scientific method, like that they're actually measurable. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you want to know whether it was successful or not. So how can you right. set the thing up? So, you know, if it was a success or not. Um, yeah. yeah. It sometimes it's hard, right? Like if you take out an ad in the newspaper and people call you on the phone, you wouldn't really know they saw it unless you asked them, like, how did you hear about us? Right. Or you enrolled in some other service, like I forgot what it is that gives out like different phone numbers for you to track. I can't think of it right now, but like one of those numbers being used, you know that, hey, that's where it came from. Like, and it's especially with like print marketing too, right? Same thing yeah. um, with postcards and, and and hangers and stuff like that. If you're just giving the, reg the regular phone number, unless you, like you said, you ask and having it in your process to ask, that's really what it is. Yeah. Cool. So I know we only have three minutes. So oh, no. wow. <laughs> what's, what's your, um, what's your vision for like the next year? Where do you hope to grow and what do you expect the challenges to be? Sure. Um, I think right now we are going to start positioning more and more into the cloud, like understanding how to secure people. What are people using? You know, I think a lot of third party apps are starting to become more and more used outside of the Microsoft and Google suite realm. So, you know, you have those that are adopting box.com for their file sharing, like what's being done to secure that. Um, is there an automated way to do that? You know, something like that, or even like zoom, like a lot of people are starting to use more zoom stuff. Like how do you integrate yourself to make sure that policies in there are, are done properly and how can we automate it if we can, right? So a lot of cloud solutions, um, a lot of in investment in teams and really just shifting into that, um, per user model is really where, uh, we're going to shift our focus on there because I do truly believe that after things start to move more freely, I won't say go back to normal. Um, I think that there's going to be a lot of cloud emphasis as we kind of move forward. So that's where I'm placing that bet. And then also being able to um, really see kind of how the economy will stand. Like, I think that, you know, a lot of businesses made the promise to their employees and, and commitments that, you know, not a lot will change or get cut in 2020. But I know a lot of businesses, especially big corporations, their fiscal year ends at the end of this year. And so January, 2021, seeing where what happens there and how that trickles down, right? Because those that are employed are customers of our customers. And if they're affected, will trickle to us. So that's probably my only thing we're looking for to see how that shapes out. But I think those two pieces of what we look for and what we're concerned to see would probably summarize to those two. Cool. Thank you so much, Paco. Great interview. Thanks for being on. Thank you everybody for attending. Paco, I'm sure we'll talk soon and sure. uh, have a good rest of your day, everybody. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it. Talk to you later.